if aliens visit us. The outcome will be much as when Columbus landed in America, which didn't turn out well for the Native Americans. We only have to look at ourselves to see how intelligent life might develop into something we wouldn't want to meet. The words of Stephen Hawking. Thus is the theme of tonight's story. Well, my dear friends, as ever, it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink. And listen. Tom was ten years old when the alien visitors arrived, and he raptly watched the television screen as the camera caught the silver sphere that descended from the deep blue void of space. The Umanish had at last arrived on his world. It had been all over the news media for several months. Aliens from the depths of space were on the way, and had indeed made contact with scientists, scholars, and national governments from all around the planet. Umanish was as close as anyone could come to pronounce in the name of the alien race, based on the one static-played broadcast that they'd sent. The newscasters played a recording of the broadcast intermittently as the Umanish grew closer. His favourite newscaster, he'd always thought she was very pretty, though he'd started to notice it more of late, had played the Umanish message many times, but it never grew tiresome for him when she introduced it. Scientists and scholars were still striving to obtain a more accurate translation of the Umanish language. They had an encrypted laser file that included basic instructions on the language, and much of it had been released to the public. The alien's language was very guttural and deep to Tom's ear. Father said that their vocal apparatus, but Tom was pretty sure that meant their throats, mouths, tongues, and so on, was different from that of Tom and his people. Father also said that the Umanish might be larger and would have a different physiology. Tom knew that meant body. He'd ask Father. The International Government Council had sent images of people from all around the world and of various regions and items of interest as a welcome to the visitors. They had included language recordings of the predominant language of the most technologically advanced nation, my very own, and images normally used to teach the very young. This was similar to the format the aliens had used, so the assumption was that it was the appropriate response. The Umanish had neglected or been unable to send images of themselves along with their overtures for a meeting. This had led to much speculation about their physical nature. Some even wondered if they had a physical nature. Now Tom and everyone with a television would at last see for themselves. Many had speculated on whether the reports were real. Others, such as Tom and his family, held out hope that the Umanish would be benevolent and would bring prosperity and unimaginable gifts. Still others felt that the arrival was a harbinger of doom and behaved in a fearful and hostile manner. Many held religious beliefs that were at odds with the reality of life forms from other worlds. There were reports that, in some less developed parts of the world, there had been violent demonstrations. Tom and everyone in his immediate family crouched around the television and leaned expectantly toward the screen. They marveled at the gleaming sphere from an actual distant star, Tom thought in amazement. Tom had often gazed into the night sky and pondered what beings might dwell on the distant points of light. Father had told him that it was likely that most stars supported planets and that it was only reasonable to believe that, with the numbers involved, there must be life on distant worlds. Perhaps the beings on those worlds looked toward Tom's star and wondered about his life. He knew they would find it dull. Nothing interesting ever happens on this planet. The sphere descended to the greenswood of the mall in front of the Capitol building. The Capitol dome gleamed in the bright morning light of early summer. The executive himself was there to greet the visitors. There were leaders and representatives from all of the major governments of the world, and most of the minor ones. There were rows of officials, scientists, scholars, and fortunate observers. There were even high-ranking members of all of the major religions. After all, as Father had said, this event will shake the foundations of spiritual belief, no matter the religion. We'll no longer be the center of creation and sole focus of the divine. 
The sphere landed smoothly, silently and almost anticlimactically on the grassy surface in front of the Capitol building. Support structures emerged quietly from several points within the sphere to keep it upright. Tom didn't know what he'd expected. Perhaps he expected flames and thunder, as he'd seen in his favourite science fiction movies. He'd expected something more spectacular from such exotic beings. Tom's father let out his breath in a quiet hiss as the craft touched the lawn in front of the capital. The beings from another world, the Umanish, had arrived. Oh, they're here at last, father whispered to the family. The entire family was silent for a moment, and then, starting with Tom and his siblings, they all burst out into cheers. Little brother was too young to truly understand the significance of the unfolding events, but he shouted along with the rest of the family, They're here! They're here! Little brother mangled the phrase, of course. They're here! After all, he was just learning to speak. Quiet, please. Quiet, everyone, Father admonished. We'll finally get a good look at our visitors. The family members again settled into their seats and returned their full attention to the screen. After several tense moments, the sphere at last opened on the side that faced the executive and his party. There had been no visible seams in the surface of the silver sphere, but now there was clearly a round doorway flush with the bright lawn of the Capitol Mall. The sphere glittered beautifully, even magically in the morning sunlight as the first of the Umanish appeared in the opening. The Umani, that was the singular the officials had determined, was considerably taller than the average for Tom's folk. It was quickly flanked by several even larger beings. As the Umanish exited their vessel, Tom who was good at discerning details, could see that their leader walked in a slightly different, more swaying manner than its larger companions. Hmm. Perhaps there's more than one type of being in the spacecraft, he thought, but kept to himself. The smaller Umani had a larger chest and broader hips than the taller escorts. However, the escorts had broader shoulders and thick limbs and walked in a very upright manner. Each carried a bulky, long instrument. Hmm, what could those be? Tom pondered. Maybe devices for scanning or communication, like what the astronauts use. It was Tom's dream to be an astronaut, or at least a scientist. Hmm, this is getting better, he thought, as he leaned even closer to the screen. Mother automatically pulled him back from the television. She always did that when he leaned too close. It must have been from habit, since this time she didn't take her eyes off the images unfolding so far from home. Tom was interested to see that the Umanish were similar in form to himself. They had four limbs and appendages at the ends for walking and for grasping. As the news camera zoomed in more closely, Tom could see that the Umanish had differently jointed legs and arms, and one more finger than he and his family members. How awkward. To Tom's disappointment, all of the Umanish wore helmets with mirrored face shields. He remembered what father had said. The alien's home environment most likely has a very different atmosphere than ours. There's also concern that interplanetary plagues might be spread by alien organisms. We have these fears, and I'm sure our medical professionals will take proper precautions. It's only natural that our visitors would also take appropriate measures to protect themselves. Perhaps with time, we can alleviate the concerns. Some of our top researchers have said that alien organisms may be so alien that they can't attack us. Though I personally disagree and admire the caution of our visitors. Tom sometimes thought that Father could be tiresome with his constant teaching, but he never grew tired of discussions regarding the Umanish. Besides, Father was a teacher by profession. What else would he do? Well, Tom didn't care much about organisms. He wanted to see the faces of the Umanish. Were they like his own? In any way? Did they have eyes and ears and noses? 
Were they arranged in a similar manner? Would they be disgusting or beautiful or something else entirely? At last, the Umanish party arrived within several feet of the executive's party and halted. The executive approached and presented his open hands and palms in a gesture of universal peace. The executive and his party, which included several major world leaders, wore no protective gear that Tom could see. Perhaps the doctors had determined that there was no danger from organisms, or maybe they felt that the Umanish precautions were sufficient for both species. The leader of the Umanish party stretched forth its... her hand. At that point, Tom glanced at his mother and older sister. He realized that the smaller, more delicate Umani was not a different type of alien, but was a female version. The wider hips and larger chest indicated that Umanish had men and women, like us, he thought excitedly. He wondered briefly if the Umanish leader would be pretty like the newscaster. It was hard to imagine with all those fingers and the big shoulders and wrong way joints, but the exotic nature of such a being could perhaps contribute to its beauty. The female Umani gestured in a firm manner toward the executive and his party. She swept her arm across the area, encompassed by the park. She spoke in a deep and garbled version of Tom's language, and the sound came from a small, rectangular box below her helmet. Just as Tom was finally able to make out the words that the Umanish leader had uttered, he saw a step forward and strike the executive in the midsection. He dropped to his knees and then fell over on his side. The Umanish leader kicked him hard. As the executive's security staff moved forward to protect him, even as the other members of his party stepped back, the alien leader reached to her side and grasped an object. She pointed the object at the executive. This time, Tom was shocked by the thunderous noise and brilliant flash of light that ripped forth from the instrument and reduced the executive's head to a shredded, wet, steaming remnant. The security team halted in their tracks and reached for weapons of their own as the remainder of the party cowered from the humanish giant. The security details of the various dignitaries all attempted to cover the retreat of their parties. The Umanish leader continued to blast away at any who attempted to draw a weapon. The executive's protectors quickly succumbed to the consuming fire. The Umanish who flanked their leader opened fire with their larger weapons before the steam had stopped rising from the executive's ruined corpse. They fired at the security staff members first, and then at the dignitaries. Oh, those weren't scanners like on space travelers, Tom screamed in his mind as his jaw dropped and his eyes bulged. His legs attempted to crawl up inside his torso and his shoulders hunched, attempting to do the same. Tom and his family watched in silent horror as their government representatives and leaders from around the world were slaughtered before their very eyes. Then, streaks of light emanated from the sphere, and the Capitol building was shattered and engulfed in flames. The stones that made up its facade actually started to melt. All oh, was panic and chaos as the entire crowd attempted to flee the onslaught of the Umanish. Some security members managed to return fire at the Umanish, who still stood at the foot of the ramp. Their weapons appeared to have little or no effect. The Umanish calmly stood and slaughtered all in their view. A team of Umanish exited the ship and began to corral the scientists and religious leaders, striking any who didn't immediately capitulate. As the weapons flashed and roared, and dust and smoke rose from the ruins of the capital city, one of the Umanish turned toward the camera and pointed its weapon. The television went dark. Tom's father seized the remote control and rapidly switched to other channels, but all were already dark or went dark within seconds. Most of the cameras must have been in a designated area for media. It didn't occur to Tom until much later that the pretty, 
Yuskaster was dead, reduced to a steaming heap by the weapons of the Umanish. Father explained that it was more likely that the broadcast satellites had been destroyed, and perhaps she had survived, but Tom didn't believe it. He could barely picture her face by then. His young mind was filled with much more intense and frightening images. The few working stations Father managed to get all showed the same. Death and destruction inflicted by the Umani. Father sat back in dismay, as though he wanted to be elsewhere, but couldn't make himself look away from the screen. Mother quietly wept and shook her head. Big sister clung to mother and trembled, and little brother wailed in bemusement. Little brother couldn't understand why everyone was upset or crying, but he must have sensed that it was bad. This can't be happening, thought Tom. These beings are an advanced race. They had to be peaceful in order to cooperate and reach the stars. Father had said so. After several moments, the picture resolved, with a great deal of electronic snow and wavy lights. The television was on a different channel than that which the family had first viewed. The elder male news anchor was at a central location and far from the horror of the capital. Still, his voice quavered and he looked drawn and pale as he spoke. All reports are that the Umanish have attacked our executive and seat of government, as well as the leaders of other nations gathered to greet them in peace. The nation and the world are shocked by this unprovoked hostility. Word is that the Umanish have a fleet orbiting our world, rather than a single exploration vessel, as they had indicated in their initial communications. The Umanish fleet is descending upon our world. At this point, the view switched to another sphere that descended so quietly and serenely to settle upon Tom's world. There was no indication of a threat from the way the alien machine operated. Tom didn't recognize the city, but it appeared large and well populated. The lights flashing from the various points on the sphere should have been a display to bring joy rather than weapons that spread devastation. Tom saw buildings, vehicles, and people explode burn and melt as the beams from the Umanish vessel brushed them. The newscaster continued. Please bear with us. We're experiencing some interference in our broadcast. We've just received word that the Umanish have destroyed the world space station. We fear that our satellite... At that point, the television went entirely dark. Within a few seconds, the lights flickered and failed. Only morning sunlight from the windows illuminated the room. Little brother was now in mother's lap. He stopped wailing when the broadcast returned. Now he simply looked frightened, and his face appeared drained of blood. He rubbed at his eyes as though the images he'd seen had injured them. Tom empathized with his little brother. His head contained a pounding ache that throbbed behind his eyes and caused him to hear a roaring noise. Father spoke, at first with a slight tremor in his voice. Perhaps the power grid's failed and the cause is far from here. Father picked up the phone and attempted to make a call. He obviously could not connect. After several more attempts, he set down the phone and looked at the floor. I guess the phones are out or swamped. Father gulped and Tom was perceptive enough to know that he just wanted everyone to remain calm and quiet. Father cleared his throat and spoke with more determination. Oh, all right, everyone. Let's get some water and other supplies and move to the basement. No one moved. Now, Father shouted. Father never shouted. This was bad, and Tom knew it. Little brother whimpered, but... Father raised a finger and silenced him. Father herded everyone into the kitchen and supervised as each family member, even little brother, gathered containers of water and food. Father picked up a small candle lamp and an old battery-operated radio that he kept in the utility drawer. Tom began to see Father's purpose and pitched in to help. Father spared Tom a quick glance and an approving smile. 
Despite his fear, Tom felt a moment of pride that he had contributed to his family's well-being. Tom and his family bustled as silently as possible down the stairway to the basement. Tom wasn't sure why they were attempting to be so quiet, but it felt the right way to do it. They mostly used the basement for storage and utility, though it did double duty as a storm shelter since they lived in an area prone to tornadoes and violent thunderstorms. Father had a small workshop and lab in one corner. Mother often teased Father when he worked on his home experiments and inventions, she said that he dreamed vastly and accomplished minimally. Father would usually either pretend to ignore her or respond with a wry smile. Mother didn't appear to be in a humorous mood today, though. Tom and his parents left Big Sister to mind little brother and returned back upstairs and brought down mattresses and bedclothes. Tom helped father move most of the large items. While they were upstairs, father made a comment that this would be like a camp out. Tom was glad the campsite was indoors. He no longer had an interest in stargazing. Throughout the remainder of the day and the entire night, there were only fleeting reports from the little radio. The only changes they heard had been for the worse. The spheres had landed and horror reigned supreme. Eventually, only static greeted Father's attempts to find an operating frequency. He turned off the little device to save the batteries. Father had often admonished Tom to be more frugal with items like batteries and electricity. Tom wished that he'd been more obedient, and as he settled into a fitful, nightmare-ridden sleep, he hoped that he'd been well-behaved enough to survive what was coming. Tom's family spent the next two days huddling together in fear, either reading aloud to one another by candlelight, or playing games to stay occupied. Tom always grew more anxious when he saw father and mother whisper quietly together. Father made short forays into the upper portions of the house to obtain supplies and to look outside. And they all did so to relieve themselves, though those were quick, furtive trips that were all business. On the second day, he reported, The entire area appears deserted. The neighbors appear to have fled or, like us, have burrowed deeply in hiding. Mother asked, Should we leave as well? There has to be some place safe. Maybe we should try and get in touch with our neighbors. Maybe one of them has a plan. Tom noted the desperation in Mother's voice. It added to his own mounting apprehension. Father thought for a moment and finally pronounced, No, we're in a relatively small enclave. It'll be some time before the invaders. Tom noted the change in terminology from visitors. Yeah, before the invaders turn their attentions to us. Well, perhaps by then our military will have mounted an effective defense. Though Father tried to sound confident, Tom had started to view him differently. Perhaps Father is a mere mortal after all, he thought. For some reason this made Tom feel sad rather than contemptuous as so many of his peers of the same age tended to feel towards their parents. He listened as father continued to speculate. I was thinking about their technology. It seems the weapons the alien use are some type of coherent light. I think the visible beams we see are mere aiming devices. When that first one killed the executive, I believe that the noise was either designed into the weapon for intimidation or perhaps it was caused by feedback from some sound equipment. Well, of course, it could be a kinetic weapon that's beyond our means, which would also make some noise. Either way, the result was unnecessarily messy. I believe that their weapons must have been designed as much for intimidation as for effect. Father's cold assessment of the murder of their national leader, and so many of their people, seemed to horrify Mother and Big Sister. They spent a great deal of time huddled together for comfort. Little brother, on the other hand, was more resilient. He tended to grow fussy due to the confined space, but thrived on the extra attention that his family had paid him. His antics and attempts at coherent speech amused everyone, and brought at least a mild levity to their terrified existence. 
The main topic of discussion was the persistent silence from the rest of the community. No neighbors had approached, no local leaders had attempted to communicate. Mother said she believed that everyone must have taken similar precautions. It was, after all, part of the civil disaster plan for everyone to use their basements as a protective warren in case of emergency or natural catastrophe. There was a comfort to being surrounded by the solid earth. On the third day, the family, weary and beginning to feel the emotional tension from confinement, awakened to rumblings and shouts muffled by distance and the walls, but obviously coming from just outside their home. Stay here, father ordered as he bounded for the stairs. Of course, Tom ignored him and scrambled up as quickly as he could behind his father. At the top of the stairway, he almost ran into his father's posterior. Father had stopped, and now bent forward and crept toward a window in the front of their house. Tom followed in the same manner. He paused beside his father at the window. Father darted a glance at him, but, but didn't reproach him for disobeying. Instead, he immediately returned his attention to the view through the window. Tom focused his attention outside as well. What he saw was at first confusing, but he soon understood that the silver orbs that moved silently along the roadway were a similar, smaller, ground version of the Umanish sphere. The ground vehicles were simply an elongated sphere sliced in half, with the flat portion facing the ground, like half an egg. Oh, a terrible egg from some prehistoric alien monster, Tom shuddered. The rumblings the family had heard had originated from a nearby house that now lay in smouldering ruins. However, the rest of the neighborhood appeared to be intact. Umanish, in their armoured suits and helmets, walked beside the battle eggs. They carried the long personal weapons that Tom had seen on the first day of the invasion, and escorted a group of captives. The prisoners, Tom recognised some as his neighbourhood friends and their families, appeared very frightened and confused. Many appeared injured and on the verge of panic. Tom felt that he should have seen many more faces than were present though. At that point, Tom heard a loud announcement emit from the lead battle egg. Absurd name for such an evil machine. What an odd thought in such a tense situation, he said to himself. The voice sounded like one of his people, but Tom could not believe the message. You will surrender quietly. Our... There was a thud and a squawk. The announcement began again the voice slightly tremulous. Your world has been conquered. Your defenses are destroyed. You will come forth unarmed and join the prisoners. Come peacefully, you will not be harmed. Just before the announcer was silenced, Tom heard a deep, guttural, and badly accented, That's enough, Shag. Apparently, Shag was what the Omanish called Tom's people. He briefly wondered at the meaning of the alien word. They obviously had as hard a time with Tom's language as his people had with theirs. Perhaps that had caused the problem. Father had said that the entire invasion may have been caused by miscommunication. He hadn't said it with much conviction. Tom didn't really believe it either. No, the Umanish are just plain evil. Father swallowed hard and then did so again. He sat back on his haunches and sprawled back onto his rump, collapsed in defeat. After a long, tense moment, Father stood and rubbed his head. Tom had noticed his father did this when stressed, as when Tom or his siblings behaved badly. Tom now regretted all those moments. He watched as Father climbed slowly to his feet and shuffled over to the stairway that led to the basement. Father was downcast, and his shoulders were slack. He called quietly to Mother, and told her to bring up Big Sister and Little Brother. Tom looked back toward the window in time to see a group of Umanish approaching the front doorway. One of them pounded on the door with its fist and shouted something in its own throaty tongue, 
a line ending with Shag. The doorway shook with the fury of the large beings pounding assault. The Umanish then stepped back and aimed its weapon at the door. Tom dropped to the floor and sprawled as he heard the doorway explode. He saw through his closed eyelids the flash of light and felt the heat as the molten remnants of the entrance to his home flew in every direction. Oh, how big they are in person, Tom thought, as the first Umani crouched to enter the house, a move necessary even through the destroyed doorway. It turned slightly to one side to negotiate the entrance hallway to Tom's home. Its broad shoulders still scraped against the interior walls. It kept its weapon pointed forward and led the way, muzzle first into the living room. Tom rolled onto his back as the huge alien approached him. The massive creature pointed its weapon a few inches from Tom's face. Don't move, Shag. It boomed in a poor approximation of Tom's language via the box on its chest. The meaning was quite clear to Tom. Besides, the only movement of which Tom was capable was a tremble. Other Umanish entered the dwelling and seized father and then poor mother, big sister and even little brother as they reached the top of the stairway. They flung Tom's family to the floor. Mother clutched big sister and they curled together in a tight, fetal ball. They shivered and wept in abject fear. Little brother lay crumpled in a tiny heap on the other side of the room. His piteous cries at the approach of the Umanish ended with a sickening crunch as one of the largest flung him into the wall. The creature then made barking sounds. Laughter, Tom thought briefly. Father attempted to rise and move toward little brother. The invader who had pointed its weapon at Tom knocked father back to the floor with its huge, strangely jointed arm, back by its massive shoulder. Father landed in a heap, much like little brother, with his head on the floor and his eyes looking into Tom's. The big alien raised its foot and stomped on father's neck. Tom heard the snap with preternatural clarity. Tom stared into his father's eyes as the light faded from them. Tom's father, the brilliant and all-powerful force in his life thus far, was gone. Then he looked up at the Umani in front of him, the new, all-powerful force in his life. Tom felt his heart plunge to his feet in fear, and his bodily fluids soak his clothing and spill onto the floor. He mindlessly stammered, Please, Umani, please. Tom looked up at the alien's mirrored face shield as it loomed over his prostrate form. He could see his own narrow grey face, fringed with green-tinged fur, drain of blood as his huge purple eyes watered and his large incisors shook above his quavering chin. His long ears were laid back along the side of his head, and he shuddered in abject fear. <sighs> it's not Umari, Shag. It's human. There was more of the booming barking laughter, and then darkness. You know the worst thing? It sounds about right, doesn't it? That's exactly what we'll do if and when we ever meet alien life on their planet. Don't hold out much hope for us, to be honest. Ah, oh, well, oof, depressing thought for this uh, cold November evening. But, well, remember everyone, it's just a story. Who knows? We might end up being nice, just for once. <laughs> well, special shout-out. I forgot to do one last week. And this week it goes to the one and only VDIF22. Does fine, fine work, very, very much underrated, and deserves you all going and looking up in its channel and subscribing and commenting and liking and you know the rest. Well, it's enough for this weekend. Make sure you go visit his channel, okay? You have a good one, and I will be back again very, very soon. Something on Sunday? 
Ah, oh, go on then. You've all been good. You deserve it. Until then, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay?